Hello and welcome. This is week 11 of our term, Orthodox Spirituality 2, the Psalms. Please take a few moments to reflect on the opening prayer, and then we'll turn to today's lesson plan. We are beginning our examination of Book 5 of the Psalterion. And this week, I have brought you something very interesting indeed. It is claimed by some, and I'll get to this on a future slide, that if you take the Bible and you look for the very center of the Bible, going by the chapters, what's at the very center of the Bible? Well, it is claimed that it's Psalm 118. And what's very interesting about Psalm 118 that on either side of it are two very interesting psalms. We have Psalm 117, the shortest psalm in the entire Psalterion, and Psalm 119, the longest psalm in the uh, entire Psalterion. So this group of three, 117 through 119, are very interesting psalms to analyze for this week. The shortest psalm, the longest psalm, and the psalm that's claimed to be in the right in the center of the entire Bible. Well, what's special? about Psalm 118, if indeed it is the very center. Well, that's the psalm that talks about the cornerstone that was rejected by the builders and become the cornerstone of the temple, very Christological psalm. So these psalms are very, very intriguing. So let's begin our review with the shortest psalm, 117. So someone, knowing that you've taken this course, might try to trick you with a question, asking you, what is the shortest psalm in the Bible? Now you have the answer. It is Psalm 117. How short is it? It's only two verses. Let me read it to you now. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. For his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. That's it. That's the shortest psalm. Now, you're confronted with such a short psalm. We looked at long psalms before. What is interesting about this psalm other than it's very tiny, it's very short? The questions to ask are, why is it in the Psalterion? What is, what, why is it there? What's distinctive about it? It is said by scholars that the shortest psalm is also the most theologically profound. Look at the very first line. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Consider the original audience of this psalm. It was part of the temple worship of Judaism. Why is this line here? Why is this psalm here if it's about the Gentiles? If it's calling upon the Gentiles to praise the Lord? That is the magnificent aspect of this psalm. It is a psalm of community worship, of Jews worshiping God, calling upon the Gentiles, all you peoples, to worship Yahweh. That is what's significant about this psalm. And it is short because the point is not going to get lost of what it's about, is that Yahweh is not the God of just the Jewish people. This is the creator God of the entire world, of all peoples. There is a message within the Bible as a whole that the destiny of the religion that began with Abraham and Moses throughout the entire history of the Hebrew Bibles was always meant to be religion to be revealed to the entire world. It's a worldwide faith. It's not something limited to a particular ethnos, to a particular people, to a particular expression of the Mosaic faith expressed by Moses, Mosaic, it is a psalm announcing the God that is being worshipped is greater than has been talked about in the Hebrew Bible. Again, remember that King David, all these psalms in his honor attributed to him, in many ways, well, of course they're reflecting upon the Torah and Moses, but it's trying to show you know, we've seen the promised land is different than what you thought it was when Joshua entered into Canaan and started conquering. We want a land of milk and honey. It is something else. 
Here is a reminder, and the temple is going to be something else. In the New Testament, Christ says the temple, he's going to raise it up in three days. He's not talking about a stone building. He's talking about his own body, the body of Christ we put on in baptism. And here this psalm is trying to teach the people that your religion is not just for Jews. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. It's a very profound psalm that Jews are singing this. And so let's get into a little bit of its theology and some of the controversy. Let's use that word about this psalm in contemporary Judaism. Let's turn to that on the next slide. I have spoken about the Jewish Study Bible throughout this term, and I'm personally very intrigued by it, particularly when the insights it gives seem ironic or strange or perplexing to my eyes as a scholar. And this is very much an example of that. So let me read this commentary. And then I'll explain why it is, seems to be strange and perplexing to a scholar's eye. So the Jewish study, Jewish study Bible says, The shortest hymn in the Psalter, calling on all nations to praise God, also in Psalms 67 and 100, God's steadfast love and faithfulness to Israel are divine attributes, what gives God his special identity in the world, and are worthy of universal praise. God is not expected to work on behalf of the other nations, but only on behalf of Israel. This in turn demonstrates to the other nations God's fidelity to his people, and for that they will praise him. End quote. So we read the psalm. is a psalm calling upon all nations, all people, all Gentiles to praise God. But the Jewish study Bible is saying here, they're only praising God because they're seeing what, they're, what God is doing for Israel, but God is going to do nothing for these Gentile nations, which seems a very strange thing to do. Why would the Gentiles praise how wonderful another nation's God is? And that's it. And God does nothing for those nations or acknowledges this. It's a perplexing claim. And in fact, the Jewish study Bible here identifies Psalm 67. So I'm going to turn to that now and continue this thought why I think, as a scholar, the Jewish study Bible is doing something ironic, strange, and perplexing about claiming the psalm is just the entire world is just going to acknowledge how great Yahweh is to Israel. And that's the end of discussion. They mentioned Psalm 67. Let's turn to that next. Here is Psalm 67. As just indicated, the Jewish Study Bible indicates as another example of the Gentiles being mentioned, but it's claimed God is exclusively, that means to the exclusion of everyone else, it's exclusively for the Israelites. Is that the message of Psalm 117 and Psalm 67 here. Let me introduce the new psalm. So the psalm itself. God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us, shalom, that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the people praise you. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations of the earth. Shalom. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the people praise you. Then the earth shall, shall yield her increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. So the Jewish study Bible is arguing the divine favor is exclusive. Exclusive to the Jewish people, meaning in exclusion of everyone else. And they claim that's the message in Psalm 117 and Psalm 67. That's not what Psalm 67 appears to my, my eyes to be saying. All the nations of the earth will sh sing for joy and praise God shall fear him. Fear means be obedient to. And your salvation among all the nations. That Hebrew word for among 
really means throughout each and every, everywhere, meaning God's salvation is inclusive of the entire world. And this is the perplexing message I'm getting from the Jewish study Bible, that sometimes the message of the text is being constrained either to just historical remembrance and nothing about today or the future, or the message is seen as particularly reserved for the Jewish people. Well, you see here the Jewish people are indeed included. God, our own God, shall bless us. Okay, that means the Jewish people. But what about everyone else? No, all the people of the world will praise God. Why is this? As a scholar, I've been working on this, and I think the answer is pretty obvious, that uh, the Hebrew Bible, you know, originated within the Judaic community, and there's a great deal of resentment that other religions, Christianity and Islam, are trying to claim the Hebrew Bible as part of their own faith traditions. You know, what are these Christians, what are these Muslims claiming the Hebrew Bible, which is our Bible, and trying to use it in their faith with their own interpretation? So you're seeing a little bit of backlash here that this is our Bible, keep your Muslim and Christian eyes out of it, is sort of to overstate it, but to get over the point of why is the Jewish Study Bible making particular claims about Everything in the Jewish Bible is exclusive to Jews only. No, that's not what's written there. The actual literal text says this is a God of the entire world. And it's not like the entire world will just admire Israel as, well, Yahweh really loves them without being converted, without being changed, and God's blessing you know, extended to them as well as salvation. So I think that's the tension I'm detecting in the Jewish study Bible. The more academic reading, which we'll get on the next slide, is like, no, no, absolutely, the Hebrew Bible is testifying this is a religion for all nations, for all peoples. It was revealed within Judaism, yes, but that light was meant to shine and illuminate the entire world so everyone can be part of this community, part of the those who fear Yahweh, God fears, those obedient to God without necessarily becoming Jews. That's what God fear means, or plenty of God fears in the time of even the New Testament. Many of the Romans, you know, learned to love Yahweh, but, you know, had no particular interest of taking those steps necessary to become Jews, but they loved God and were faithful to that God. They just did not want to become full Jews because they were Roman soldiers or Roman citizens for whatever reason. They were part of that community on the periphery. So this is some of the tension behind the scenes about how we interpret this psalms is there's a jealousy about the Hebrew Bible and how Christians and for that matter Muslim scholars look at it you know as yes Israel's part of the story but it's not the end of the story. So let's turn to the academic analysis and some interesting findings about the psalm itself. So the academic commentary by Brueggemann, who has guided us throughout the term. So first, this note. It is said that right in the middle of the Bible, you'll find the book of Psalms. In the middle, you'll find of the whole Bible, Psalm 118 at the center. And Psalm 117, of course, preceding it, being the shortest psalm, and Psalm 119 following, being the longest. So it seems to be special for that reason. It is said, you know, but it is said, just know that. You know, that is a claim, but how do you actually find the middle of the Bible? Well, apparently, it's only using a particular form of the Bible, the King James, and only counting chapters, not words, not verses, but chapters. What is the middle chapter? And the issue there is also the chapters and verses are not part of the Bible. They were added later in the Middle Ages, so it would be easier to make references to. So you have a whole bunch of arbitrariness about what is the middle and how do you count it to result of this claim that the middle of the Bible is this. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not going to count the chapters. I'm not going to count the words. It doesn't matter because it still leads us to examining these three psalms together, and that's worthwhile and that's engaging. So Brueggemann talks about this particular Psalm 117 is remarkable, and he quotes here 
a particular scholar who's quoting someone else, you know, that the amazing thing about it is the inclusiveness of the summons to prayer that attests to the fact that Israel is not the end of the revelation of the Old Testament. It is the instrument which its God has chosen to manifest his glory to the entire world. So Israel is the torchbearer of the light that will illuminate the Gentiles and all the nations. And that's certainly how Christians see it. We've seen how, I guess, for lack of a better word, Orthodox Judaism and jealousy protecting the Hebrew Bible wants to keep that light to itself and the rest of the world is being in admiration of all the things God does for them. But no, the message of the Bible is a light for the entire world. So it's a tension you should know about. Theodoret, in his commentary on Psalm 117, is certainly mindful of Isaiah chapter 42, where God promises to send his servant who will become a light to enlighten the Gentiles. And so with that in mind, when Theodoret looks at this psalm, he's already thinking the Messiah, the Christian context, and what that means. And so in light of Isaiah, he interprets Psalm 117, that it means he summons all to a dance at the same time. He provided the occasion of salvation for all the nations, not Greeks only and Romans, but also for savages employing the sacred apostles as ministers of benefaction. Quoting now, go make disciples of all the nations, he said baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I commanded you, end quote. They're quoting Matthew 28. You see the verses there. So Theodore gets the message of Psalm 117. It's inclusive of the entire world. The entire message of the Hebrew Bible, as testified by Isaiah, is the Messiah will come, the true servant of God to enlighten the Gentiles, to spread the message unjealously to the entire world, even to savages. He uses that word there. We would not use that word today. And savages being us, perhaps, is the best way to read it. We have been enlightened, too. Now, this is also an occasion to talk about this amazing verse, the Great Commission from Matthew 28. Go and make disciples of all the nations. It is commanded of us. And that's certainly what the apostles did. They went to foreign lands, uh, to the Gentiles, and established uh, their churches throughout the world, as we have seen. The issue with Matthew 28 is in its translation, make disciples, that historically that was interpreted violently. Like as a kid, you know, you know, in a playground, will say to another child who's trying to bull him, yeah, try to make me. You know, it is a forcible conversion of someone to your faith is how this is re uh, has been read historically. Go make disciples of all the nations, whether they want it or not. That historically has been the understanding of that. That is not in the Greek language that was used to write the Bible. So this is an occasion to talk about Matthew 28, and what that means to make disciples. Very interestingly, that phrase comes from a single word, an imperative verb. And it's an imperative verb of a particular noun. The noun is, noun is math, mathematis, which translates as a student. And so mathematis, student, now is an imperative verb. How do you translate that? Imperative word is a command. And so you see the typical translation is make disciples, but that's not how it functioned in the ancient world. You never made someone your student. In the ancient world, as revealed by Justin Marcher, Justin the philosopher, becoming disciple was entirely voluntary act. And it was based on whether or not the prospective student thought you had anything to teach him. And so Justin Martyr first goes to a Stoic and says, I want to be your disciple, and stayed for a while and said, nah, this is not for me. And then he went to an Aristotelian. He says, I want to be your disciple. And he studied for a while, said, that's not working. 
And he went to a Pythagorean and said the same thing and studied for a while. And said, nah, not for me. Then went to a Platonist and said, I want to be your disciple. And studied for a while and said, no. And then finally met a Christian and said, wait a minute. Now I found something worth learning. So in the ancient world, being a disciple was someone would try to attract students. And the students would stick around to see if you had anything to teach them. So the idea of go forth and make disciples is really the idea of attract disciples, of being such a virtuous person, such a representative of your tradition. People say, I want to be more like you. What can you teach me? And so a better translation, Matthew 25, would be attract disciples from all the nations. So this is much, very much a side point. So you see what Theodore right? And the idea of make disciples, what does it mean to make disciples? It means attract someone to your faith based on the virtue you exhibit to them. And I use the example of Justin Martyr, who went through many different teachers until he found the Christian faith and said, I've actually found the true truth and the one I want to dedicate my life to. So just an interesting note. We can talk more about the Zoom, but it was an occasion for me to bring this up. So Theodore is going to draw out a point that will become very clear when I get to the next slide. But in reviewing the history of the Jewish people, well, you can't not overlook the fact of the, uh, of the Babylonian captivity and the different uh, tragedies that happened to the kingdoms when they were conquered. What happened to the Jewish people? They came a diaspora. They were scattered around the world. And so Theodore writes, in former times, Jews were scattered to the ends of the whole world, taught to worship the one God. So since they were no longer occupied, only since they no longer occupied only Palestine and did not continue to form one people under one king, they were scattered among the nations and obeyed their rules while maintaining their own lifestyle and observing the direction of the law. He was right to speak of them as not being people, but peoples. Plural. So there was a movement of the Jewish people to be scattered throughout the world. And diaspora, diaspora, is actually a Greek word meaning to cast seeds. In the New Testament, Paul talks about going into Gentile lands and reaping that crop. And so the Jewish people went to different lands, influenced that, and made them ready for the disciples to say, to arrive and say, now we want to gather you into one people under the Christian faith. So a very interesting dynamic that will become clear when I get to the next slide. I'm going to turn to that now. And so now Theodore continues and just shows his brilliance in interpreting this psalm. He's turning back to that original question of why was this psalm sung by the Jewish people, you know, when they rebuilt their temple after the returning from the Babylonian captivity, why would they start singing about the Gentiles? Well, it's anticipation, he says, of the future through the Messiah, promised through Isaiah, you know, the light to enlighten the Gentiles. It was anticipation of that future. So he writes, since therefore the God of all fulfilled the promises, bestowed the salvation he promised, and opened the fountains of mercy to all, we, he's now speaking about the people who wrote the psalm and how it was performed in the past. We, the psalmists and the choirs, who have come forward from the Jews and you who have come to the faith from the nations, the Gentiles, blend together into one people in harmonious singing and thus repay the benefactor, end quote. I cannot underscore how amazing and beautiful this interpretation is. This psalm, this shortest psalm, was written in anticipation of Christ when the Gentiles would be enlightened and come to the faith so that the Jews and the Gentiles could worship God together in harmonious singing and collectively repay God, the benefactor. Is there a more beautiful psalm than this? <laughs> well, you can say any psalm you like, but today, you know, this one delights me uh, more so than the others. And so 
it is a beautiful theology. And so one aspect of theology is, again, it's not exclusive, meaning to exclude the other. So the Jewish Study Bible says this psalm is exclusive, meaning no Gentiles are included. They just admire what's happening to the Jews. Some Christians today would say, well, the light that God shines is, is exclusive to Christianity and not also the Jews. Here, Theodore is saying, those who have come forward from the Jews and you have come to faith from the nations, from the Gentiles, blend together in harmonious singing. So very much an inclusion of the entire world with the light originally revealed in Israel coming to the fullness of revelation in Christ, who then enlightened the world through his apostles, who attracted many students to the faith to want to become Christian. How that looks in the future kingdom, how much, you know, we can talk about in the Zoom, how much of your if you come from the Jewish faith of that Judaic identity you still retain after the revelation of Christ, not an important question. The important question is how we sing together of singing about the promises of Yahweh, revealing salvation to the entire world, fountains of mercy to all. It's not exclusive, it's inclusive. Psalm 118, as the central psalm, you know, for our discussion today of this three psalms, is very long, has many ideas, but I'm going to curtail my discussion to two very interesting ideas for today, one of which is the most obvious and the most important, and begins at verse 22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So that is Christological. That is mentioned in the New Testament. The New Testament is referring back to here. And also this line, verse 24, this is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. That's the day that will have no end. That's the fullness of the kingdom that will dawn. We who see the light of the evening anticipate this day of paradise to come. So this is the psalm at the heart, it is claimed, of the entire Bible, and it is Christ. And we'll see what St. John Chrysostom has to say about this, and it is beautiful. But St. John also has some very interesting commentary about verse 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And he takes time to talk about this, though it's very much a side issue to the true glory, which is Christological. But I want to talk about it, too, and I'll turn to that momentarily. I did not include commentary for the previous slide because I've already discussed its essence. You can stop the video and read the slide for yourself. Psalm 118 is about the resurrection. And it's about the day that will have no end, about the kingdom to come. And you can see that, and that slide is from the OCA website, or the material in that slide. So academic commentary about, historically, how was it understood and practiced in Israel? Well, he writes, Psalm 118 is a thanksgiving psalm from ancient Israel's worship. Though it contains a variety of elements and thus a variety of settings have been instructed for the tax agent setting. And he says it might have been part of an entrance liturgy, the beginning of the liturgy, where the worshipers gather for a festival and, and proceed with praise and thanksgiving, and followed by an antiphonal litany and singing. So it might have been the very start of an ancient literary, uh, liturgy. And some of the details about the psalm, it of course recounts the history of that leads up to the temple. You know, how did we get here? How do we get to the temple? So it's going to go through the Torah, from Exodus, from Egypt, from second Exodus and exile to the new temple that was constructed after return from the Babylonian captivity. So it's a psalm of thanksgiving and remembrance. So the Jewish study Bible doesn't have much to add to what I've already uh, spoken of. 
Uh, it is acknowledged it's about the rebuilding of the temple after return from Babylon. But it has some interesting comments about that key metaphor of what is the cornerstone that was rejected. And he says, well, that's a metaphor for Israel itself, that somehow it is the keystone, but to what and to what end, it doesn't offer. It just says, no, Israel is the keystone that's spoken of here, that was rejected by the rest of the world, now it's returned to worship, but a keystone to what end? And so the Jewish Study Bible has nothing further than that to add. St. John's commentary is very intriguing for a number of reasons, one of which you can detect a little bit of frustration in what he said and what was dictated to his students and what was recorded for us today. He was frustrated that most people only know part of this song, and particularly uh, verse 24, this is the day the Lord has made, which was used liturgically and ignorant of the entire psalm. They only focus on the part they like, and he's frustrated with that. And so he says, well, the fathers prescribe the singing of that verse by the congregation on the grounds that is melodic and contains elevated teaching. So it does. So that may get perfect teaching from it, though ignorant of the psalm as a whole. Notice his little frustration there. We, on the contrary, must address ourselves to the whole psalm even if the middle section has the best material. Again, people have been focusing on the stuff they like. At that point, remember, occurs the statement, the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner, which is that Christ also said to the Jews, recalling an event in the New Testament where Christ himself says this, you know, recounts this psalm and confronting the Jews. So certain aspects of the psalms have drawn considerable attention. And he's frustrated the entire psalm is not being acknowledged. And unfortunately today, I'm going to be repeating that. I'm going to talk about the most interesting part of the psalms and only including one other thing that was important, very important to St. John when he gave his commentary to his students. So I'm going to be partially obedient to St. John here. I'm going to include more than just the great parts about the day the Lord has made and a cornerstone that has become, you know, the true cornerstone of the true temple of God. There's more in there. So I'm going to include one of those things in there that St. John thought was important for students to know. So here's one of the ideas that St. John Chrysostom wanted to get across to his students. One of the parts of the psalm that's being ignored because the liturgy focuses on the very prominent Christological themes. And it's about, do you put your trust in the Lord or do you put your trust in men, in human beings? And this becomes a very important teaching opportunity for St. John. And he brings forth a king from the Book of Kings as a lesson for his students. So I'm gonna read the quote. This, is, this was the reason Hezekiah is said to have suffered what he suffered. He had an inflammation. He thought he was going to die. Because the sun's changing direction, then recovering its distance it had lost, a miracle revealed to Hezekiah, and despite a sign happening of such proportions as to startle, the sun changing direction in the sky would startle, he preferred to be impressed by events not of God's making, but of human agents, fearing assault from them. Hence he showed them his treasures, placing his trust in treasures that were exactly the reason why God was exasperated and said, all this will be carried off. That is, what you have placed your trust in, what you rely on. And this is from 2 Kings chapter 20. The story of Hezekiah, and I'm going to talk about it more on the next slide, but just to reveal the history here, Hezekiah became ill. And then he miraculously recovered. But when he recovered, he was delighted to receive um, congratulations by emissaries from Babylon about, we're very happy you recovered. And Hezekiah, being thrilled to receive these emissaries from Babylon and being thrilled to still being alive, then said to the emissaries, I am so happy, let me show you my defenses, my treasuries. He took 
basically spies from the Babylonians a tour of his kingdoms and showed him all his wealth. And look at all this greatness I have. So you're basically showing the robbers. In the future, Babylonian, Babel, the Babylonians would conquer uh, Judah, and it certainly helped to have an entire map of the kingdom laid out for them because Hezekiah was dumb enough to be flattered by human beings rather than trust in God. And this is the point St. John wants to come across, that Hezekiah should have been delighted with God's miracles and not the fact that emissaries from Babylon gave him flattery. And responded to that. And this is why God said, you showed all the treasures of the kingdom to the Babylonians. Because of this, it will be carried off. You will be conquered and your treasures will be stolen. What you place trust in and what you really rely on was things of this world and not of God. So St. John really wants to point this out. And let me continue the discussion on the next slide. Now, one part of the story I haven't been able to discover is exactly when Hezekiah became to be seen as a saint within the Orthodox faith. Of course, you know, Christ descended into Hades and rescued all the righteous, you know, that, you know, Adam and Eve as shown in the icons of the resurrection, that he pulls them out of their graves. Also included, but not depicted in our iconography, are all the righteous ones from that history leading up to Christ, including here, righteous Hezekiah. And he's a complicated figure in terms of uh, the history. In many ways, he was a good guy. He was a reformer. When he learned of idolatry happening in the kingdom, he had reforms put in place, and for this he's recognized. So he gave orders to destroy the idols throughout his kingdom, reminding the people of the punishments which fell their ancestors forsaking the true God. After this, idolatry ceased, not only in the kingdom of Israel, but in also many places in the kingdom of not only in Judah, but also in Israel. So he was reformed. For this, he is recognized. But that's only part of his biography. He was a complex figure. You see from the book of Kings here, and I included the actual text on the screen, is this episode where he very foolishly responded to flattery from Babylon and showed the emissaries everything of his kingdom. Okay, here's the walls, here's the defenses, here's the armories. Oh, and look at all these treasures we have. It would be really bad if someone came and conquered us and took them, which is exactly what happened. So then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming. When all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon and nothing shall be left. So Hezekiah trusted in human flattery more than he did in God, you know, at least in one this one tragic incident, even though he was a reformed figure. So he's a complicated saint. And Maybe St. John, in picking this guy to teach to his students, so don't just praise this guy for destroying idolatry. Also realize he set the stage for the conquest of Judah and the destruction of the temple through his foolishness. And so it's very interesting. He went to lengths to, to contextualize you know, Hezekiah in remembrance. Maybe he was seen a saint even at this time in history. And for us today, when we recognize him, his feast day is on August 28th. He's also celebrated on Cheese Fair Saturday. Know that you're only celebrating his reforms against idolatry and not his foolishness in trusting human flattery more than he trusted the Lord. So now we come to the aspect of the psalm that most people know and recognize. Verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. What does that mean? Christ uses those words in the New Testament. So St. John will write about this, and what's also remarkable about what he writes is a refreshing and uncharacteristic praising of Judaism that's rare to find in the writings of St. John. So let me read it to you. That this refers to Christ is clear to everyone. You see, not just any stone is fit for the corner 
only the most acceptable, capable of joining two walls from both sides. Now, what is remarkable? The cornerstone, the coming together of the two nations, which promotes godliness. After all, vast numbers of the Jews came to the faith, and the apostles were from the Jews. The word sped to the whole world, you see, attaching every one to the truth. So this psalm is said to be the very center of the Bible. That's a very apt way of thinking about this psalm because it talks about the cornerstone, that which unites two things, two traditions. As a cornerstone, it unites the entire history of the Hebrew Bible up to that cornerstone, Christ. And the other wall being the history of Christianity since then. So this is the joining together of the two Testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament, here in Psalm 118. At the center is Christ of the ancient Jewish tradition and the ensuing Christian tradition, you know, which happened uh, through the apostolic churches in that time. So Psalm 118, the perfect psalm to be in the very center of the Bible if that's actually true, depending on how you count chapters and, you know, which uh, apocrypha are you including or not and all of that, let's call it the center of the Bible. It's joining together the two into one to one, centered on Christ, capable of uniting the history of Judaism with the new revelation of Christ that has changed the world as we experience it today. So now we turn to Psalm 119, the longest psalm of all. And as such, I'm not going to read you the entire psalm. I chose two passages here for to read to give a sense of what's happening. So let me read this. It begins this way. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimony who seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity, and they walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes, then I would not be ashamed. When I look into all your commandments, I will praise you with an uprightness of heart. When I learn of your righteous judgments, I will keep your statutes. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. Now picking up at verse 25. My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. I have declared my ways, and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, so I shall meditate on your wonderful works. My soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. Remove from me the way of lying, and grant me your law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth, your judgments I have laid before me. I cling to your testimonies. O Lord, do not put me to shame. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. And it goes on. It's the longest song. You'll see certain details here that, depending on the Bible you use, it will highlight this aspect that the psalm is in tribute to each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. I read the section for Alf and Daleth, but it continues for each and every letter. It's part of the poetry. But the tone of the psalm is a person in dialogue, in hope, and aspiration with the Lord about teach me and, and enlighten me and guide me and my dependence upon God and I Promise to meditate on your wonderful works is about a person in dialogue with God trying to be a better human being through understanding the precepts, the statutes, the commandments of God. And then I will praise God with an uprightness of heart, for you shall enlarge my heart. It is about a person wanting to be changed, wanting to be transformed for the better. And notice this line at line 25, my soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. There is an implication here of the resurrection. As a created being, I am from the earth. I am from the mud from which Adam's created. The mud 
and which God breathed life into, that the bones of the grave, which Isaiah saw, and Ezekiel, the valley of bones transformed into living beings. Once again, revive me according to your word. It's about the host for the resurrection. So very much, very Christian, very beautiful. And just as another little side note, that in inspiration of this psalm, since the whole psalm is not read except on one very special day, Holy Saturday, that the words from vouchsafe, O Lord, from our Vesper service, get some of his verses from your psalm. Do you notice in vouchsafe, O Lord, it seems to be repetitive about teaching me your statutes, understand your precepts, instruct me in the way of your commandments. Well, yeah, it, they're all kind of the same thing, but the repetition's important about nuance and also echoing the psalm, which many commentators saw, say is very repetitive you know, about the ideas expressed. The ideas in the Elf section are also present in the Dalif section that I've read here, but it's a person on this journey of improvement through faith that's important. Here's the commentary of the Jewish Study Bible. Uh, I'll read it and then comment on it. This is the longest psalm, indeed the longest chapter in the Bible. It is comprised of an eightfold alphabetic acrostic. Many early critical scholars consider this psalm monotonous and devalued its emphasis on law. More recently, the skill of the poet in composing this tour de force has been appreciated. For example, there are eight main words used for Torah. Their English translations include word, law, commandment, rules, decrees, precepts, and teaching, corresponding to the eightfold acrostic. So, end quote. So, a couple of things there. I'm going to explain what an acrostic is on the next slide. But I find it a little bit humorous that biblical scholars historically go groan when they see the psalm because it is so long and so repetitive. But the repetition is part of it. Is like training for an athletic event. You have to train every day, even though you're doing the same exercises, maybe slightly different way on each day. You got to keep doing it. Got to keep doing it. This is part of the personal quest for improvement through the law, through the rules, the commandments, the precepts, the teaching, the statutes. That is different emphasis on how do you become better and Part of the point of the psalm is to be long. It's this idea of, of training uh, in virtue to understand God and to worship God correctly. So what is an acrostic? Well, an acrostic is a very fancy form of poetry. It's fancy in the sense of it takes a lot of skill to, per to pull it off. And you're doing something very clever, which may not be immediately understood by the person hearing it. Now, the basic idea behind acrostic is there's sort of a hidden pattern to be seen. And it's very much like an abbreviation. Like if we hear the abbreviation today to our ears, CRA. Oh, you know, that's Canadian Revenue Agency. Acrostic kind of does something like that. Acrostic is a composition in which the first letter of each line spells out a word, message, or in this case, the alphabet. So this psalm is written with the Hebrew alphabet in mind, and beginning with elf, the letter A, he'll conform an entire composition around that letter, then move on to, to beta, and then go on. So it's considered a very erudite, a very high level of poetry, and... Being constrained sometimes is seen as, well, it can be used for a mnemonic device, for memory retrieval, for understanding particular virtues associated with particular letters of the alphabet. That's all part of it. And for the poet himself, it's also considered only the most skilled poets can do this. So whoever composed this particular psalm was showing off. But showing off for a purpose, showing off how each letter of the alphabet corresponds to a virtue in the virtuous life. Now, an example of an acrostic in the uh, Christian uh, tradition, you see at the bottom of the slide that these particular letters, ichthys, you know, 
you know, the fish symbol of Christianity, it really stands for, that was sort of a secret message of what's, what's about fish. Well, if you spell it out of Greek, fish in Greek, you know, you spell out the name of Christ. You see it here at the bottom of the slide. So it's a type of an abbreviation of a bigger message. And so you see ichthys here as secretly identifying yourself as a Christian at a time when that could be a death sentence because Nero was running around persecuting Christians, or an acrostic as a grand form of poetry, such as this psalm, where each letter of the Hebrew alphabet corresponds to a song of praise that teaches a virtue that you can remember of, okay, this letter, Dela, is teaching me this virtue, and I bring it to mind. So it also has a way to memorize something in a particular way, the poet showing off. So let's continue with our analysis on the next slide. Part, one part of Christ's ministry was to be an exemplar for us, to teach us in the ways of virtue. And Christ was obedient to the Father, his Father, even unto death. And this is why Psalm 119 is part of the matin service for Holy Saturday, when it's read in front of Christ's tomb in the center of the church in darkness, when we meditate upon his life, his teachings, his virtue, how he's an exemplar for us. So Psalm 119 is about a life lived in virtue and a contest to become better, and in Christianity, you have the message, when you finish the race, you are crowned with glory. And so, so too with Christ. He would be crowned with glory upon the resurrection, the resurrection that is also promised to us if we persevere in faith. Though my soul clings to the dust, I know God will revive me. Just like Ezekiel saw the bones of the valley revived by the breath of God upon them, so too we pray for this, too, if we persevere in virtue. So Holy Saturday, a very solemn day about obedience even unto death, but in hopes for Easter Sunday and for the resurrection that awaits us all and to be born unto everlasting life where we will be revived. Reading Psalm 119 in context of Holy Saturday, and are the virtues we're commanded to personify throughout our lives, add something to our appreciation of this song. So academic commentary through Brueggemann, again, has a very interesting note, an important note, that this psalm is along the psalm, repeats and echoes and reinforces the message of the very first psalm very first psalm, as we discussed, is a reflection on the promises that await us if we are attentive to the message of the psalms, of the entire Torah. If we are attentive, if we learn our lessons, that's all about Psalm 119. Repetition. With this letter, know this lesson. With this letter, know this warning. With this letter, learn this message about God that's important for our own spiritual development. So there's many echoes of Psalm 1 here in much more detail in Psalm 119. Theodore has much to say about this psalm, but I'm going to again curtail the discussion to a few important lessons, beginning here with this overview about the historical occasion for this psalm. So he writes, the divine king David experienced many and varied changes in circumstances. He both fled enemies and pursued enemies, fell into despondency, and in turn experienced a more satisfying life, traveled the divine path, and stumbled in his travel, and again followed the divine laws. So he gathered all these experiences together into this Psalm, by putting together with one another the prayers offered to God by him on each occasion, he proposed a single instruction of value to people and teaches what 
he says how it's possible to exercise virtue in practice. So what he's saying is that King David had a very complicated life, as we know. And he experienced many things during his life. But all these things that he experienced became opportunities to confess, to repent, to turn to God, to learn a new virtue, and to slowly grow from a very fallen, selfish person to someone truly worthy of admiration and orthodox remembrance of this saint. And so King David, in tradition, gave us this song in order for us to learn all the lessons we need to learn from all the mistakes and all the things he learned along his way. And so very much as a teaching experience of the prayers, you know, very much it's an individual praying is the voice of the song. You know, in the psalmist's imagination, this is King David, his prayers to God which we repeat in order to learn a virtue to help us along our way. So Theodoric continues, building on, building on this idea that this psalm is a reflection of King David and his own prayers in order to find God after even his mistakes and his repentance, that it becomes lessons for us. So he writes, he declares blessed, those traveling the royal way, meaning King David royal, without deflection, not transgressing the norms of the law, either to the right or to the left. He brings out who these are who walk in the law of the Lord. Those who live like these have a blameless character. He calls a, way, a life a way. We trans, transverse it from womb to tomb. So this is about our lives how we live our lives, how do we walk the paths of our lives with a blameless character. This is what Psalm 119 is about, that it is prayers corresponding to each letter of the alphabet, so they're easier to remember, each teaching of virtue for us to understand and appreciate and try to learn. Teach me your commandments. Instruct me in your precepts. Help me learn this virtue. It is a way to become righteous, to take the person who you are and make you better. You know, through the example here and the prayers given by King David. So this psalm is very much about learning virtues, but virtue is no single thing. And he'll list many different virtues here on the slide. And I'll have a very specific example of a particular virtue to learn on the next slide, because it's easy to talk about virtues in the abstract, but what do you exactly mean by virtue? Well, let's look at his commentary. We need divine understanding to practice virtue according to the divine law. By exercising loving kindness, not to have regard for vain glory. Through spiritual exercises, not to cast about for human commendation. And through the continence that arises from not not from the shame of intemperance, but from the desire for virtue to practice confidence. That means perseverance and unwavering dedication, a particular way of life. Thus, the inspired author is right to ask for a share in divine understanding so as to discern the way of righteousness. Make me understand the way of your precepts. It's a very interesting verse, verse 27, that the person knows what the precepts are, but make me understand the way of your precepts, that I want to know what it means to live a life of loving kindness day by day with continence, with, you know, unwavering dedication to this principle of loving kindness and not to be susceptible to vainglory and the hopes of human praise like we saw with Hezekiah. You know, he's very susceptible to flattery and cause destruction because of this. Make me understand the way of your precepts. Is someone on a journey but trying to do it right? It's like an athlete trying to learn the right technique for running or for javelin throwing, whatever it is. You understand what it means to throw a javelin, but how do you do it with the proper technique so that it's correct and right? That is what this psalm is about. It is very monastic in the sense of people dedicating their lives to spiritual perfection as much as the flesh is able to do 
through asceticism of every sort and through prayer and meditation and hesychastic ways that you want to do this, you want to understand it, and you want to be perfect in the way of practicing this so you can be like the person in the psalm approaching God and not be blameworthy at the end. So it's a way to improve yourself, to walk in the way of righteousness every day without deflecting to either side. One additional note, this word about the law. This is obviously the law as interpreted in the Psalms. As I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, we have the laws of Moses. But then the Psalms come around and say, well, the laws of Moses, you need to understand them spiritually. God does not want, for example, burnt offerings. He wants a humble and contrite heart. That's what God wants. So it is the law as it's spiritualized in the Psalms about the true message. God doesn't want you to kill animals as a sign of faith. He wants you to understand. He wants you to understand the spiritual nature of the law and how to practice the true law, which is loving kindness, not animal sacrifice. You know, that was just for a time in the desert for people who didn't know any better. You know, it is time to grow in our understanding. This is what this song prays for. Here is a very specific example of a lesson to be learned from this song. It actually uh, came up during our Zoom class discussion. I'd already designed this lecture, but someone asked about uh, Psalm 91. And it just so happened to be something I want to talk about in relationship to Psalm 119. So verse 28, my soul melts from heaviness, end quote. What does that mean? My soul melts from heaviness? So Theodore explains the lesson to be learned by referring to other psalms here, including Psalm 91. So he writes, the constant assault of sin often impairs the quality of thinking, causes the athlete to fail, and produces the so-called weariness. The Greek here is asidia, while the soul that is puffed up invites sleep. Sleep, however, brings on death. Hence, the inspired author asks to be strengthened and confirmed. He says this also in another psalm, give light to my eyes, lest I should ever fall into the sleep of death referring to sin as death. The context of the psalm is found in Psalm 91, where sometimes particular translations, um, they can be very colorful, but a particular translation talks about a demon of noonday. And let me explain what that is before I get into the other issues. It is something that we all experience in life. As I talk to in Zoom, if you remember your days as an undergraduate student, or if you're an undergraduate student, to, uh, right now, the worst time to take a class is at 2.05 to 3.25, that block of time, because you suddenly are very sleepy. You've had lunch, you've been awake for many hours, and suddenly that time it is the most impossible thing to keep your eyes open and keep focused. You know, that is Akadia. That is what is called the demon of noonday. It is when your body fails and you're tempted to veer off the path rather than doing what you're supposed to be doing, like monks and monasteries. You know, this is a time they set aside for study of the scriptures. And instead, all they want to do is sleep and they don't study scriptures and their spiritual training starts to fail. And if they continue to doing this, they can lose their way and, you know, fall into death that uh, they become disillusioned by the monastic life. So the demon of noonday is that particular thing that affects your body, that makes, um, makes uh, a period of time usually defined as, you know, after you've had lunch, you know, between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. is when you're not very productive. So how do you be productive at these times when your body wants to fail? You need particular virtues. You need particular training. If you're an athlete here, you don't want to fail. So uh, Akadia is spiritual authority, and it can plague those pursuing prayer life or the spiritual life or the monastic life or just a Christian life. Different times of day, I've also heard this time referred to as the dark tea time of the soul. You know, nothing productive is going to happen between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. 
how do you fight this? Well, perhaps this psalm will you know, give you that second win, that new strength to rededicate yourself to your prayers during this time. So that's a very specific example to add to the discussion of Psalm 119. Each part of the psalm corresponds to a different letter. Each letter becomes a long prose in testimony to a lesson to be learned or a virtue to be developed or a temptation to be avoided, such as Acadia, this dark D time of the soul that makes you want to give up your spiritual pursuits. So that is the lecture for today. I look forward to our Zoom discussion here in week 11, and I look forward to seeing you all uh, this coming Thursday.